Today we're going to study the mathematics of cooperation. Because cooperation is a bit of a tricky thing. Sometimes when you can trust the people around you, you can work together with them to build something that gives a better payoff, a better reward for everybody. But if you can't trust the people you wish to cooperate with, you might be better off just to go off on your own and to get the best result that you can by yourself. This creates the trust dilemma. And in this video, we're going to use the power of game theory and in particular, the foundational concept of Nash equilibrium in game theory to try to give a little bit of insight and intuition into the trust dilemma. This playlist on game theory is sponsored by Brilliant. More about them at the end of the video. Let's begin with a very specific example called the Stag Hunt game. The basic idea of this game applies in many different real world situations like technological adoption by companies, international relations, and so forth. But I'm going to present this the standard way it's presented in game theory, which is we're going to pretend we're all hunters, not that I know anything about hunting. And the idea of this is that you can go hunting for one of two different animals, a stag or a hare. And the other players in the game can go hunting for a stag or a hare as well. Now, to get a stag takes both players of the game. You need to cooperate together to be able to hunt the stag. And if you get the stag, it's a big payoff because it's a big animal. Meanwhile, hunting for the hare is easier to do, so you can do it individually or you can cooperate to get the hare. But it's going to be a much smaller payoff. There's just less meat on the hare than there is on the stag. Now, I'm going to try to capture the dynamics of this situation using something called a payoff matrix. And both players have the same decision to make. Should they try to hunt the stag? Or should they maybe abandon their post and just go after the hare instead? And I'm going to fill in this payoff matrix with a bunch of different numbers. They're made up. But the point is just to try to capture the dynamics of it. So what do these numbers mean? Well, for example, if I look at this 4-4, that's where both players are going to cooperate and hunt together the stag. The first number refers to player one, how much payoff they get. So they're going to get four units of meat. <laughs> Again, I don't know anything about hunting. And then the second number, the second four, refers to the second player. They also get a payoff as four as well. This is in contrast to what would happen, for example, if the first player plays stag and the second player plays hare. Well, this is a disaster for player one. They've tried to go after the stag, but the stag requires cooperation, requires both players to be able to get it. So they get zero. They get nothing if they try to go after the stag while the other player is going after the hare. But the player who goes after the hare, they get the hare, they get the two units from the hare. Other one, the two zero, is exactly the same, just the roles reversed. But the final interesting one is the case where they both decide to play for the hare, and then they just split the hare and they get one one each. They, they both get a little bit, much less than the four four. So the point is, the setup of my game is basically to fill in this matrix of numbers, and now we have to make the decision. Well, how should you play? Should you play stag? Should you play hare? What should you do? If you could communicate with the other player, and if you trusted the other player, then there's a clear best answer. Both players should just play stag. That way they get 4-4, four, four, which is bigger than any of the numbers anywhere else on this table. But what would happen if you couldn't communicate, or if you couldn't trust the other player, if you didn't know that they were going to collaborate in this way? How should this game be played? Now, we've actually seen a bunch of so-called normal form games, games that can be written down with a payoff matrix in this sort of format. We've seen a bunch of them previously in our series on game theory, and you're welcome to go and check out those previous videos if you wish. And previously, we had a type of analysis that actually doesn't work in this case. We talked about finding dominating strategies. A dominating strategy was a strategy that was always better than any other strategy. It didn't matter what your opponent played, you should always do the dominating one. But there are no dominating strategies in this case. For example, think about this from player one's perspective. If you know player two is going to play stag, then you would be better off to play stag than to play hare. Four is better than two. But if you knew your opponent was going to play hare, then you actually should play hare as well because one is better than zero. And because these arrows go in opposite directions, there's not like this dominating strategy where, where it's always better to play stag or always better to play hare. It depends on what your opponent does. Likewise, if you think about it from player two's perspective, in the case where player one plays stag, well, player two should also play stag. 
In the case where player one plays hare, then player two should play hare. Whether player two should play stag or hare just depends on what player one does. So the point is, there's no dominating strategies and the method we've seen in previous videos just fails. So how can we analyze it? Now, before I spoil the answer to the stag versus hare game, I want to tell you about the most powerful concept in all of game theory, the idea of a Nash equilibrium. A Nash equilibrium is some choice of strategies for each player, like say player one and player two both choose the strategy where they coordinate and go after the stag. So it's a choice of strategies for each player such that neither player can possibly improve on their own. They can't make a unilateral move, keeping the other players fixed, just changing yourself, that improves their payoff. There's a really fascinating sense of stability at a Nash equilibrium point because you can't actually improve your situation by yourself. There's, there's no thing you can do, no change in strategy that helps you. And there's no change in strategy for any other opponent as well. Everybody's just sort of stuck there at the Nash equilibrium and, and nobody wishes to change by definition of a Nash equilibrium. Okay, so are there any Nash equilibriums in this stag versus hair game? Actually, there's two. The first of them is the one we already identified, the 4-4, where both play stag. I mean, if this is the case and you find out both players are playing stag, you'd be like, great, we, we get the best payoff. We both get four. Nobody's going to want to leave that. They, they're at the best possible spot. The ones in the off diagonal, the, where one player plays hair and the other plays stag, or, or vice versa, are clearly not going to be Nash Equilibria because nobody's going to want to accept the zero. If they played stag and found out that the other person was playing hair, they'd be like, no, I want to switch. I want to play hair as well. One is better than zero. So neither of these off diagonal ones are Nash Equilibria. But 1-1 one, one actually is again. I know it's a smaller number than 4-4, four, four, but think about it. If I told you I was going to play hair, what would you do? You'd play hair as well. And then if you told me that you were playing hair, what should I do? I'd play hair as well. I wouldn't want to switch to stag unilaterally, because then I would just go down to zero if I knew that you were playing hair. So this also has that sense of stability. You're sort of stuck down here at this less desirable option where both players play hair and both players get a payoff of only one. Ideally, they'd be able to trust each other to cooperate and they could get the 4-4 four, four if they both played stay. That'd be the option with the most payoff at least. But the stability of the option where they both play hair comes about from trying to avoid the risk of ever getting zero, of avoiding a scenario where you play stag and they play hair and now you're just getting nothing. So there's actually these two different Nash equilibria. Well, which is better? Which should we choose? This stag hunt example illustrates something called the trust dilemma. We're effectively trying to decide whether we should trust the other players to cooperate with us or whether we can't trust them. If we can trust them, then we get the maximum possible payoff. We collaborate together, we manage to take down the stake, we get the best result for ourselves. And so the Nash equilibrium that results both players cooperating is sort of maximizing the payoff or maximizing the reward. So then you might think, well, why would anyone not go for that? But the other Nash equilibrium, it minimizes our risk. Because if we choose to cooperate and the other players choose not to, we really risk coming out of this with nothing. And so if we're more interested in mitigating the risk of trying to remove the possibility that we're left with nothing, then we might choose to not trust people. And so both equilibriums have a case for them. One's maximizing your payoff, the other is minimizing your risk. So there isn't necessarily a right answer to this problem of which of these two equilibria is going to be the one that's going to result. If you really trust somebody, if you can build a relationship, if you can communicate with them ahead of time, maybe you know the game is going to be played multiple times in a row and you can build up a bit of a rapport, then absolutely go for the payoff maximizing one. But if you can't communicate and you don't trust somebody, you might want to mitigate your risk. And so we don't have a mathematical argument about why one is better than the other. But perhaps this does shed some intuition into all the many different real world applications where there's possibilities of both of these equilibriums occurring and, and sometimes one occurs and sometimes the other occurs. This example was a little bit silly for sure going out and hunting, but 
You could imagine a much more realistic scenario like different companies deciding on what technology to adopt. Take something like 5G wireless technology. It requires both phone manufacturers to make phones that are capable of doing 5G technology as well as needing the cellular networks to be able to do the possibility of 5G capabilities as well. Both different types of companies need to cooperate to get the better result of 5G that, that might be more profitable to them. Or if you can't really trust that the other companies are going to go forward and get that product shipped, say this year, maybe it's better for you to decide to go for the other equilibrium, not cooperate on 5G this year and do it one year later. And this challenge where you have these two equilibriums, one where everyone cooperates and one where everyone doesn't cooperate, is a real challenge because often we want to try to encourage people to cooperate. And so we build political, social, and legal systems that are designed to try to encourage extra cooperation. Regardless, if you ever wonder why people don't just cooperate to get the better results all the time, well, maybe this example has shed a little bit of light onto that phenomenon. Now, if you want to level up your math superpowers by actually practicing and playing around with interesting mathematics, I think you're going to like the sponsor of today's video, and in fact, the sponsor for the entire playlist on game theory, which is Brilliant. Brilliant is an online learning platform that has an enormous amount of interactive courses on, well, all of the big courses that I have here on this channel, like Calculus, Linear Algebra, or Discrete Match, and so much more. I was checking out their course on math fundamentals recently, and it's delightful. For instance, this module on the difference of squares isn't just this algebraic formula the way so many algebra and calculus students have to memorize it. It really shows instead the actual geometric meaning of why the difference of squares formula works. Everything is beautifully animated, and after you see that geometric meaning, you're never going to forget the formula because you have this clear picture in your head instead of sort of a hodgepodge of symbols you have to memorize. Anyone who's watched my videos knows that I am a huge advocate of trying to show the geometric and conceptual sides of mathematics because that is better for your learning. And they don't just show you. There's so many opportunities to interact, to practice, to play around with the mathematics that I think if you want to improve your math skills, Brilliant is an excellent option. So go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazzett and sign up for free. As well, the first 200 people to click that link are going to get 20% off an annual premium subscription. And with that said, please give the video a like for the YouTube algorithm. If you have any questions about this video, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.